Based on our own experiences and research, we knew that evaluating situations from other people's perspectives allowed us to more holistically consider ethical issues. We found ethnography, or the study of people and their cultures, to be the optimal formalization of this technique. Melding the learning experience and ethnography, students will explore cultural phenomena by observation from the point of view of the subject of the study. In this case, people who engage in bioethical conflicts as part of their daily life. So essentially what our um, project seeks to do is match, and you've already kind of heard about this, is match students with folks um, both within Georgetown and ideally across the city who are somehow engaged in um, like bioethical conflicts, as Sheena just said. So that could be anyone from like IRB board participants to genetic counselors, both like at the university and like there are a lot of like private genetic counselor services in, in the city. Um, clinicians at like Lombardi, Lombardi does a lot of gen genetics counseling as well. Um, professors, we actually met with a professor, we can talk about that later, um, as well as research participants and um, patients of these clinicians. So um, that just kind of gives you a general background of who we're trying to reach out to. Um, so the way that our project is essentially structured is it, it's like a three-fold um, learning experience. So I'll talk about the first piece, which is sort of like what we've titled an initial probe of the research participant that they've um, each student has like selected or been matched with. Um, so essentially the goal of this particular phase is to like almost like dip their toes in the water. So students are going to conduct an initial probe and we've actually created like a toolkit of like various um, research methods that students can use. So everything from like artifact analysis to cultural probes and I can talk about those more in depth if you all have questions. Um, but it's like, I think there are like six or seven like different kind of smaller research tools that students can use to get a little glimpse. So like for example in a cultural <coughs> probe kit um, students are able to maybe like learn about where uh, participants like spend most of their time in the city or um, if you're using behavioral mapping where in the office this particular clinician spends most of their time. So various things like that to just get a taste. Um, and Aurora will talk about sort of what students, so I guess after students kind of receive that, that research they'll analyze it, do, uh, do like a quick understanding of what they've learned and then take that to inform part two which Aurora will talk about. So after the um, initial probe, which is just the introduction to the um, to research participants, um, students um, yeah. um, we want them to do more like in depth ethnographic research. So um, we have we kind of research five different methods: um, interviews, shadowing, silent observation, or fly the wall or fly the wall ethnography, literature review, and context mapping. Um, so the goal of these we just kind of briefly outline them in the handbook. What the Um, kind of like coding, it's just kind of drawing. 
ethnography by definition means that you do need to take the field test. So like if you don't, if you're not going to take it. So like what if, what if they're not? Wait, but the point, the point of ethnography is to, is, is by definition to take skill tests. Well, even if you don't take the skill tests, I think part of the process is getting to know the other person's perspective. So whether that be through recording or video taking, like there's some sort of like measure to incorporate. I mean, yeah, I do. Skill tests can also be like pictures. Like, yeah, right. it can be pictures or it can be like something tangible, like a product that's created. So in that sense, I guess it could be adaptable to whatever the student prefers. But the point is to have them to be able to like understand this person's perspective. And I think through that like person to person interaction in phase two, that would be like the ideal. No, I totally understand what you're saying. I was just like making sure it was adaptable. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think the so. point is to become an ethnographer for a few weeks. And so hopefully you will see some <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, so if, say like I was my, uh, for the ethnography I was doing with a genetics counselor, I feel like there would be a lot of hurdles of like what I get to sit in and hear of like, this person counsel, or like, I feel like there are a lot of obstacles of like, yes, I have like this person's permission, but there's so many other people who like, don't want a Georgetown student to be sitting in right. conversation. So we talked about that extensively, and one of the advantages of being at Georgetown is because Georgetown University Medical Center is a student hospital. Um, the understanding of like, going to like build out and, and really flesh out um, as we like take this idea further. But the idea is that at the very least there should be some like infrastructure already, especially within Georgetown, for students to potentially sit on those things. And yes, obviously like very sensitive things, like we would advocate that students like shadow like in a room where someone's finding out something like terrible or whatever. It's not um, like what they wait, need wait, wait, wait. Well if the like if the patient is uncomfortable. Like if, like, you know, we would want to like ensure that there was consent on both sides. But be again, because it's a teaching hospital, like generally speaking, those measures of like the ethical considerations for students sitting in are already in place. So we would build off of those. Yeah, but it's also about like the professional's perspective on those sorts of situations, not so much like hearing those, I mean, sitting in on some sort of consultation, but what those consultations and how they've informed like genetic counselors, like biological decisions looks like too. Wait, why is it so Um, does this like require like a lot of prior knowledge? Like so if <laughs> I'm like so kind of yeah, hilarious yeah. actually. Um, so we met with um, Dr. Yarden, who's a genetics professor in the NHS, and she was like, So much genetics background do kids in this class have? And we were like, you know, none. Um, <laughs> so so like that's definitely something that we would consider and, and would maybe if at the very least do like a small genetics unit right before just to like the DNA primer. DNA primer. <laughs> yeah, we were really close to the security side. And so. How would you get a balance of finding students to the patient's perspective? Like, the patient's perspective? Yeah. But, like, but, like, if everyone in the class wants to be with the like, genetics counselor, but no one wants to with like, the patient researcher, how do you balance who gets to go with that person? Can you actually determine whether or not they were choosing yes. who they got, or whether or not we're just, you know, just assigning one? Um, we kind of have an option, I think. So uh, 
you can gain empathy by like the brawl of the energy and stuff. Well, she could, yeah, you don't. Like, I, so I don't think that you should spend much time um, doing ethnography with students. I do think that the most valuable stuff you get is if you get some education or participants through the trials or other things. So, but I also don't Asian necessarily. Yeah. Looking at those. Yeah, we do that. But it's going to be, yeah, so I think that. Yeah. We went to Asian. So maybe we could decide on like which cultural probe types of things to 
But that's something I would say do more too. Like to try to explore other ways of communicating different parts of it. Not just like the whole thing, but each method and structure. So the video, like tutorials. What about an interactive app where you earn badges as you do each of these things? So y'all do? Yeah. <laughs> you guys in here? Mega collaboration. <laughs> So now just do a bunch of different things, like explore different things to find the right suite of like products and services or, or things. And it sounds like what you're doing, what I imagine is the the outcome of your work will be a number of different things. Probably part collaboration with the service, part with like handbooks, part other stuff. So I, I want to go back to Nico's question because um, I think that's articulating one of my what I feel vague about right now. So again, what we should focus on is you continue to grow it for the, for the... I can't tell yet whether you're presenting us with a piece of curriculum. And so a piece of curriculum is, you know, like, it's not just the reading assignment, it's here's the goal. And here's how I'm gonna get the goal, and here are the things you need to do to have the students do all of that, right? In which case, you need to have a new piece of curriculum. It's a three-week piece, or it's a, a roving clip-on piece. A, a floating assignment, but it would take about this much time. Do you see what I mean? That's if what you want to design is a piece of curriculum. Another option is to say we want to design um, uh, some uh, tools or artifacts for classes to use that a professor would have to build curriculum around. Like, why are we assigning this? But like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so this is actually largely a curriculum. Yeah, yeah that's what I want to go Because there are like different steps. So the first one
maybe as like a small part of the, like a sense of more, like the same way you're doing papers in this course, it would be that the gap would have to be much smaller, much smaller. So, scaling this down. Scale it down to, either something scale it down to done, a like science, realistically or make it a tool, or a suite of tools or something. So, sorry, then I have a question. So going back to Nico, the Nico question, if we were to scale it back and make it a tool, which I think sounds cool and like very doable and like useful, mm -hmm. and so our output then would just be a handbook, theoretically. Probably a few different things. It sounds like your output right now, with just this, your output um, or what you talked about is collaborating on part of the a matching thing, either by yourself, like, or just doing it by yourself, or collaborating with another group that's already doing something like that. That's part of your outcome. Like then um, the handbook, then you talked about the kit and examples. Those all sound like that sounds like a package of things. I would say oh. we need to do more than that too. If students, if we were to assign students, say we were to like two semester modules for this project. Here are the resources that other students may read last year. Um, that wouldn't be quite enough. Yeah, and I was going to say, and I really I do like this idea of having it be a kind of tool that, uh, in, in a way, I think it's, it's like less, you know what I'm trying to say, that right now it gives you a little bit of a weight on the methods. So that, just to say, okay, here are the methods of ethnography. Go do that with maybe an IRB person or genetics person. Students would not be able to. So, so really what your tool would be is filling in the middle. It's, you could be a background. Ethnographers are interested in this, and they do things like shadowing, et cetera. Here's the specific three things you could do. But make it specific to genetics and the empathy about how do people get to say, yeah. and, then, and then maybe just offer three things that people could do paired with somebody in the real world, which I think is a fantastic idea. But get more specific about what they might do Well, it can take three weeks if it's a lot, if it's doing it's a lot of other things. So if you're doing yes. it as a, yeah, yes. a lot yes. of okay. yeah. You also should, like, <laughs> die, like a video diary that you can then edit and make short, but that represents your experience with it. If you're doing this right now for the first time, you're going to be going out talking to other people. Well, we can do, like, a demo, not a demo video, but, like, a, this was what an experience looked like, kind of. Yeah, that's what I mean, but, like, from the student's perspective, not just, so right. I was thinking at first, like, you should do video, but here's what, like, a, an interview. Here's what Shepard looks like. That's just like a, what is it called, how test or whatever? Instructable, like 30 second, 25 second thing to show a piece of it. But then to show your experience with what's the prep look like, what's the, yeah. you know, other stuff that like just is a student back end thing. For other students to see, like people, students at Georgetown who have done this, that have dealt with some of the same issues, like how you dealt with it before trying to find people contacting these people, going to do some stuff like that. And you can consolidate that to a video diary or something. Well, it could be like an interactive website, you know, like those things. Um. Yes, maybe. I mean, I think it is. Maybe overthinking it. I think we'll watch like a 90 second video of like, yeah. um, that represents an experience similar to mine as a student, some student, that students had from previous semester doing this thing that students don't usually do. Oh, convincing students beforehand that's valuable. How does what you, what you get out of it, how that 